as we said, uh, I did a master's in space science, um, but during that time, I, I mean, you know, I had a visions as a kid of being an astronaut and things like this. But um, then growing older, um, I got interested in propulsion systems and um, got to a point in my degree where I, I was starting finding more of the bigger kind of sciences, such as astrophysics and particle physics, more interesting. And really, it was um, the influence of, uh, of a couple of professors on the summer school I went to. Um, they kind of told me about neutrino physics, and it, it, was, it was really an emerging subject. I mean, this character change between different types of neutrino was me only measured for the first time in 1998. Um, and uh, it wasn't until 2001 that we had actually seen the third and final type of neutrino um, in, in nature. So neutrino physics is still very much emerging, emerging field, even though a lot of the maths and theoretical framework is still there. Um, experimentally, it's it's again you know quite quite flourishing, and that kind of you know provided challenges and and just could have drew, drew me in, um, and I, I guess I was more interested in in challenges than anything else. Yeah. Off the back of that question, how do you know there's only three? Um, we know that there's only three <laughs> that interact via the weak force, um, and the reason for this is. Um, you can tell by the different ways in which these weak force um, uh, force carriers um, die. Essentially, you, you look at their death cycles, and um, they they all die into um, the three different types of neutrino and or um, the three different types of charged electron or heavier. Um, and you can measure the number of degrees of freedom into which they can die. Essentially. Um, and uh, this was measured to very high accuracy in the predecessors of the Large Hadron Collider in different experiments separately um, to obviously produce you know, that duplication that you need. Um, and it was measured to a massively higher degree that, that there are only three degrees of freedom, essentially, for these to die into. So. Um, but there may be ones that don't interact by the weak force, and that's another question. There might be. Completely invisible, yeah, so why would we be interested? But yeah. <laughs> it's, they, they could exist. So. Yes, sir. Are there any other, are there any theories that predict neutrinos, sorry, different types of neutrinos other than the three that have been discovered so far? Because I know like before, the, yeah. the Higgs boson was theoretically proposed 70 years ago, 80 years ago, and only now have we been trying to experiment, trying to actually find it. So are there any like theories that, or mathematical formulae that so, so um, we can look for different types of neutrino um, that don't interact via the weak force by looking at the character change again, um, because because this oscillatory probability change of what type of neutrino you might see at a certain distance for a certain energy, um, you you <coughs> measure um, the numbers of this oscillatory pattern, how often it peaks and troughs, um, and how often it changes. Um, and you can measure these numbers, and you would only expect to, if you have three different types of neutrino, you'd only expect to be able to, you know, you'd only need um, two or three numbers to perfectly define this oscillatory pattern. Um, but if you see something that's inconsistent, if you, if you measure um, more modes, if you like, more um, peaks and troughs than you'd expect, um, then that can only be associated to um, maybe a fourth type of neutrino that these things are changing into. But a type of neutrino that we definitely can't see via the weak force because of the things I explained earlier. Um, and so there are searches for these, um, and they're called sterile neutrinos because they you know, don't interact at all. Um, and at all of the experiments, um, such as the one I'm on, do look for these sterile neutrinos. Um, but the, um, you know, we are pretty confident so far. We haven't seen any evidence for them. Oh, got no. oh, this one. Sorry, sorry. That's one more. Oh, sorry, sorry. <coughs> just, a quick, just a quick question about um, if you only find like one neutrino a day kind of stuff, I mean, what do you do for the rest of the day? What kind of maths do you use, or what is the statistics you use, or are you kind of using calculus, or what is it, number, like what exactly is the maths involved in all this? Um, well, if you like, it's like putting. Um, uh, a dot of paint on an impressionist painting a day um, and waiting to see the picture build up and that's essentially what we have to do um, and 
the rest of the time, I mean, we've got bigger detectors now, and as I say, we've got more intense ways of, of firing. We actually fire neutrinos, so it's much more intense. So we get to see larger numbers. Um, but the rest of the time, what is also important is uh, that we know exactly um, how the eye detector is working and uh, how often we might see something that isn't a neutrino. So we're always constantly measuring, um, well, in fact, uh, heavy electrons, muons, coming from the sky. Uh, we use them to make sure we understand exactly how our detector is working so that when we do see a neutrino, we know we can calculate its energy and direction accurately. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question? Um, are you disappointed that the term neutralino has been coined, given that you work Neutrally, no, no. I mean, that's that is, that's a whole new. So I mentioned symmetries between matter and antimatter. Um, a neutralino is a supersymmetric neutrino, and so there's other. So you've got matter and antimatter, but you've also got a mirror version where you have things called supersymmetric particles. Um, and this is, um, yeah, I can try and explain. It. It's a symmetry between the force carriers and the matter particles, um, and so they kind of change. Uh, there are other properties which they change around, um, kind of inherent properties not to do with the forces themselves. Um, and you can, I mean, you know, you've got neutralino, you've got the tauino, muino, um, but you, and then um, you've got squarks. And so th this, that's, that's just the way that they're coined. And supersymmetry um, has been dealt a blow recently by the LHCb experiment. Um, they've they've um, kind of measured a whole vast amount of possibilities um, for supersymmetric particles to exist and they've kind of quashed them. There's still areas in which they can exist um, and you know it would be very interesting to see if that is new physics um, because um, things like supersymmetry kind of gives a common point in the, in the early universe where all the forces were one, where they were a common force and that's important for you know unifying um, well everything uh, uh, at a common beginning, so yeah. Sorry, is this okay? Is this okay? <laughs> Yeah, you said already you put some money on the Higgs, um, <laughs> so which is which. Yeah, it's fair enough. Um, to be honest, I would have put money on it as well, not being found. Um, I like I like being a bit uh, skeptical. Um, it's a big year for the LHC because um, they are going to rule out or see the standard model Higgs. Um, with the data they're expecting this year, they will rule out or see whether the standard model Higgs exists. As I say, if they don't see this standard model Higgs, the one that um, is being used currently in the theoretical framework to give mass to all the particles, um, then you're going to look to new physics. You're going to look to things like supersymmetry, or you know, so, uh, there, are, there are other models as well, other Higgsless models as to how mass could be given to these particles. Um, and so uh, if you don't see the Higgs, I think, again, very exciting, because it means you, you, you don't know what you thought you knew about the universe. There's something else beyond that. And then that's brilliant, because you start getting to um, think of new experiments, new ways of kind of trying to see how nature's working. So I think it'd be brilliant. And in terms of neutrino physics, we'll probably get to the point, um, not the end of 2012, but in 2013, where we start to look at the difference between matter and antimatter. Because now, now we've kind of pinned down the uh, changing characteristics. We can start looking and comparing matter and antimatter. So, uh, yes, sir. Question, yeah. Um, because we send them in short, sharp billionths of second bursts, um, uh, you send it as a naught or a one in binary. So if you, if you see a neutrino burst, it's a one. If you don't, it's a zero. Um, and because the timing is accurate enough, um, you only need to see the one neutrino. So you, you send you send trillions of these things in very short bursts, and you have a probability that you'll see it. Um, and if you if you do see it, and that's good, um, that's a one. Or if not, it's a naught. That's where they get their ninety nine percent accuracy from. Seeing lots of ones. So. No, no, sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, sorry. really appreciate that, guys. And <coughs> um, just a quick Cheers. thing. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, <laughs>